Hi everyone, welcome back to lecture 15. This is part 2 of this lecture set. We had been talking about the various classes in medieval society and what roles they fulfill. So now let's take a look at a very successful medieval king by the name of Charlemagne. He by the uh, 8th century AD had risen to become king of the Franks. The Franks were one of the largest peoples in Western Europe. They had already gobbled up a tremendous amount of territory as you can see from this map here. The pinkish shaded area was the Frankish kingdom at the time that Charlemagne took over. But then look at all the yellow shaded areas. He will end up uh, through a series of, of, uh, of probably more than, than 54 military campaigns during his 40 years in rule, he's going to significantly enlarge his empire. For this reason, he is sometimes referred to as the father of Western Europe, because you can see he's going to take over uh, such a, a tremendously large amount of territory. And he was do, able to do this because he was an excellent warrior and a brilliant strategist. Uh, he used a very small army, relatively small army, of only about 8,000 men. But he was very good at getting them where they needed to be, training them, uh, and he could also be exceptionally cruel to those that dared raise their hand against him. So uh, in some ways he was able to defeat his enemies before even getting on the battlefield with them by kind of uh, psyching them out, if you will. Uh, they knew that if they did not really give in that, that he was going to be quite cruel to them. Charlemagne is also remembered as someone that helped to spread Christianity through brute force in Western Europe. And uh, everywhere he went, he demanded, he did not request, he demanded a uh, conversion to Christianity. If you did not choose to do so, you would be killed. For example, in 782 AD, after defeating the Saxon tribe at, near Verdun, he ordered 4,500 of his enemy to be beheaded headed because they continue to worship so-called false idols. For this reason, he will come to the attention of the Roman Catholic Church. He will give a good deal of military aid directly to Pope Leo III. And also, Leo is kind of impressed by the fact that he's helping to spread the faith throughout the continent. So Charlemagne will be crowned Holy Roman Emperor by Pope Leo III on Christmas Day in 800 AD. We will actually circle back to Charlemagne a little later in this course and talk about him not just as a warrior, but as someone who is committed to uh, reviving education during this very violent time in European history. Now, no matter how successful a king like Charlemagne may have been, even he couldn't get everything done all by himself. He had to have some help. So here's the concept of feudalism, which turned into sort of the dominant economic and political system in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. You can see this flow chart here that I have on the left, how the king is at the top of all these relationships, because that's really what feudalism is. It's a, a system of mutual obligations. You give something to someone, they give you something back. The king gives his lords, we talked about this, the nobility, uh, grants of land, and in exchange they give him their loyalty and military aid. And in this process they become vassals of the king. You can see this word here on the chart here. Um, a vassal, kind of a loose definition, is an employee, right? You enter into this relationship to the king, you pledge your loyalty, you become one of his vassals. Now we'll skip over this sort of secondary step with knights because you don't need to know that that's a process known as sub infudation. Don't worry about it. Uh, but at the very bottom, if you'll notice, of sort of this power pyramid are the peasants or the serfs that we mentioned at the beginning of this lecture. These are the guys that are doing the bulk of the labor day in and day out. They are working the land of these feudal lords. And in exchange, they get access to this land. They don't own it. It, it always remains in the possession of the feudal lord, but they get access to do what they know best, which is raising crops, harvesting them. And in exchange for access to land, they owe the lord of the manor uh, a portion of their crops. They also, um, you know, owe him their loyalty. And another thing that they get in exchange is they get military protection. The serfs or the peasantry are not warriors, but they, if the alarm bell is sounded, that there are intruders in the region, they get the ability to go behind the protective walls of the castle so that they can protect themselves and their families.
So let's get a little more specific and talk about one particular society, one particular medieval state that will start growing in power and stature over time. We'll start with England. Now England, or Roman Britain as it had been known when the Roman Empire in the West was still in existence, uh, England will end up, uh, once the Romans are sort of forced out um, as the western half of the empire crumbles during the 5th century AD, we're going to see uh, invasion forces coming from different areas. We'll see the Angles and the Saxons uh, sweeping down through the island and setting up a kingdom, a centralized kingdom over time. Then you fast forward to the 8th and 9th centuries AD and you're going to start to see the Viking invasion sweeping down from Scandinavia. Um, ultimately what we have is by the 11th century AD we have an Anglo-Saxon kingdom that manages to control much of the territory and what we think of as, as England today, with the exception, of course, of Scotland and Ireland. But in sort of southern England today, this Anglo-Saxon king, kingdom under Edward the Confessor was moving along and, and this, you know, uh, the population was increasing slowly. And when Edward the Confessor died, he left no male heir. There was no one in his immediate family to take over control of the throne of England. So what happened at that point is you have a series of English noblemen, and these English noblemen who had served their King Edward, now dead, uh, faithfully decided to choose among themselves. They will choose a one of their own, a man by the name of Harold Godwinson, to become the next King of England. However, there's a contender for the throne, someone that doesn't even live in England or speak the language of the local peoples. This contender for the throne is actually a cousin of the now dead King Edward the Confessor, and he lives in Normandy in France. The man who will rise up and say, Edward was my cousin, I get the throne, will be William of Normandy. Uh, William of Normandy known because he was uh, a duke in control of these regions in what we think of as sort of northern France today, Normandy and Maine. Across the English Channel, you'll notice he's not even from England, but when he hears that the throne is up for grabs, he will mount an invasion force in 1066 AD, and at the Battle of Hastings, he will manage to defeat Harold Godwinson and his forces. March north northward so that by Christmas of 1066 AD this foreigner William the Conqueror as he becomes known will wrest the control of the, the throne the English throne and um, come to become king the next king of England when he does so there's tremendous resentment against William like I said, he doesn't speak the language. He was uh, not who the, the royalty wanted there. And so he's going to have a time kind of settling people down and, and getting them accustomed to his rule. In order to do this, he will order that all vassals now have to swear a primary oath of loyalty to him. They are not loyal to anyone but this new king. Those that refuse to do so would be arrested tortured, some of them lost their lives. He will also be curious as to what he now owns as King of England. So in 1086 AD, he will send out a number of advisors, those who are literate, who can keep records for him. He will send them out to the countryside and go door to door and ask people, uh, who lives here? How many people live here? And in particular, who owns what? Who owns this land? If you don't own it, who does? Who owns this livestock? If you don't own it, who does? The collection of this assessment will be the Domesday Book, which has been is still with us today. We uh, have this wonderful snapshot of what life was like in medieval England in 1086 A.D. Uh, very detailed account of um, how the land and uh, the, the movable property was divided during this period. When this assessment is concluded, William can now lay claim to one fifth or 20 percent of all land in England, and. What's also significant about William taking over the throne is he will join together the crowns of England and France together for the first time. And what I mean by this is he was not King of France, but he was a vassal to the King of France. So that when he hops the English Channel and makes his invasion and takes the crown of England, because he is tied to the crown of France, that's what I mean by he sort of symbolically joins together uh, these two monarchies for the first time. Again, much to the dismay of those who actually live underneath his rule in England.
After William passed away, we have a continuing succession of English kings who will continue to try and strengthen the power of the monarchy at the expense of the nobility. And in fact, things get kind of desperate for the nobility by the 13th century AD. You have King John, who is depicted here signing the Magna Carta. Uh, King John will be rather ruthless. Uh, he will imprison members of the nobility without any kind of warning uh, on the least amount of cause. He will throw them in prison. Some of them will die in prison without ever having the benefit of a trial or ever having their guilt or innocence uh, kind of assessed. And he will simply seize their lands. Uh, he is doing this to make money to wage war against the French to take more territory on the continent. So by 1215 AD, the nobility will actually rise up against King John. They will arrest him, hold him in custody, and they will force him to sign this document, the Magna Carta, or the Great Charter, in which the king will be forced to reform the judicial system. He will be forced to acknowledge that a right to a trial by a jury of your peers is a fundamental right of all English citizens. And in doing so, in realizing that his power was not indeed unlimited, the Magna Carta was the first time that we see an English king agreeing that his powers were actually limited rather than unlimited. Now I want to say a quick word about how the role of the nobility is changing during the late Middle Ages. Um, under the feudal system, members of the nobility owed the king their military service. But during the late Middle Ages, we're seeing that military service is increasingly not really needed by the king. Internal warfare is settling down. The Viking invasions are over. So what the, many of these kings will do is ask that their nobility simply switch roles. Instead of primarily being warriors, now he needs them to do administrative work. He will ask them to join his king's council. And this will be a, a series of advisors who will do administrative work for their kings. They will hear court cases. They will determine tax policy. You know, kind of all the nuts and bolts, the boring stuff of, of running a kingdom. Many of these monarchs will start to offload onto their king's council because they don't need them for warfare as much. Over time, in England, if you'll note the difference here in this first box, the King's Council will ultimately develop into the first form of representative government in England. The King's Council will eventually develop into Parliament, uh, a body that is still with us today, a bicameral legislature in England, House of Lords and the House of Commons, in which the people get to elect representatives. The same thing will take place uh, to a slightly different end in France, where you have the King's Council there, which will morph into what will become known in France as the Estates General, where you have representation of the three estates in French society. You will have the clergy that will be represented there, unlike in England. You'll have the clergy, you'll have the nobility, and you'll have the commoners with representation there. Please note that Parliament is not the same as the Estates General. Understand how they are different. Parliament in England, France having the Estates General. So France, after Charlemagne's reign, will kind of fall into disarray. Uh, they will, the French crown will lose a lot of territory gradually over time to, uh, to warfare. And it will take several centuries, in fact, for the French crown to begin to gather more territory back through warfare and through strate strategic marriages. And really, when we talk about a dynamic medieval French king, we look, need look no further than Philip IV, uh, who was known as Philip the Fair. And this was someone that was not interested in sharing power with anyone, including the Roman Catholic Church. And in fact, Philip will call upon the Estates General, that representative body that I just made mention of, in a fight that he will have with Pope Boniface VIII. Philip will be... Uh, very much interested in raising money and, and through illegal means if he needed to. He will seize territory from the Roman Catholic Church. He will seize church lands and sell it off to raise money. He will also expel the Jews from France in 1306 and in the process confiscate all of their property and, you guessed it, sell it off to help finance his wars. He will even go after the Knights Templar, a crusading organization, will seize their territory and, and uh, on holdings and for this reason he and Pope Boniface VIII are going to get into a major fight. At that point, he will have the papacy move from Rome, where it had always been, to Avignon, 
a city in southern France. This is shocking. Uh, not only that, he'll have the Pope arrested. Uh, Boniface will actually die in the custody of Philip's troops, and he will intercede, and, and Philip will make sure that his man, a yes man, will be elected as the next Pope 